Hello and welcome to a somewhat unique episode. We are participating in this year's Paleo Rewind. This is where a bunch of people who talk about paleontology on YouTube get together and review what interesting papers came out in the past year. And we took the month of June. In June we had a publication about the continuing adventures of that really exquisitely preserved Borealopelta specimen. In this case they found a cololite, which is the stomach contents of the animal. It is composed of gastroliths, which are those stones that some dinosaurs would swallow to help them grind up their food. And in among those gastroliths are what it was grinding, the plant matter, which is all quite pretty under a microscope. You should go look at figure four in the paper. Paper's open access, you can, it's free, go, go read it. There are some cycad cycadophyte traces, as well as some conifers, but there's much more fern material, which we maybe could have predicted since ankylosaurs are not exactly high browsers. The authors also noted that they are apparently uh, selective feeders, like modern sheep or goats, where they weren't taking in a large amount of extra branches and twigs. Though from the little twigs that they did take in, we can look at the growth rings and get a timestamp for when the plant was eaten and therefore when the animal died. Because the outermost growth ring was incomplete, they figure that this was sometime in the middle of the growing season, so uh, late spring to midsummer is when the animal died. There's no definitive evidence of flowering plants, uh, which is not surprising. Neighboring formations lack those. But what is surprising is the absence of horsetails. That might be because the food that this Borealopelta ate was not exactly normal. It turns out that a lot of the plant material in its belly had been burnt, and the authors concluded that this was the result of a forest fire. Wildfires were a regular occurrence in neighboring formations. You know, you have these large conifer forests dominating the landscape. They're going to burn at regular intervals. So Borealopelta was taking advantage of post-fire succession foliage. So don't feel too bad for it. It didn't die in the fire. Uh, it was moving into the area afterwards to take advantage of this new and palatable growth that was sprouting up, uh, as well as uh, relatively unobstructed movement because all the trees had burned away. So it died for some other reason, which is kind of sad. Well, let's talk about how dinosaurs were born. That's happier. We had two papers on June 17th about soft-shelled eggs from animals we didn't think laid those. There is a approximately American football-sized crumpled up egg from late Cretaceous rock in Antarctica. There's nothing in the egg and there's no parent, but there are mosasaur bones from this locality, so the authors think that this might have been a mosasaur egg. We've never found an egg from a mosasaur before. We have found pregnant mosasauroids that still had the embryos in their abdominal cavity, and that confirmed a suspicion we had because as air-breathing aquatic animals, we figured that they would have had to give live birth. But maybe the babies did have a thin, soft eggshell, and the mother gave birth to a vestigial egg that hatched immediately. And that thin membrane only preserved under very specific circumstances. The sea that this came to rest in was anoxic and high in hydrogen sulfide, which is very similar to the bottom of the Black Sea today. So organic material preserved really well down there. Or it's a dinosaur eggshell that washed out to sea. What? No. Dinosaurs laid hard-shelled eggs. That's impossible. Well, workers shot some eggshells, fossilized eggshells, with a laser and watched how the molecules vibrate. I'm sorry for the technical terminology, and determined that Protoceratops and Mosaurus laid soft-shelled eggs because they lacked the chemical markers for biomineralization. This clears up some inconsistencies in our understanding of dinosaur eggs, because it's been assumed that because living archosaurs, crocodiles and birds, lay hard-shelled eggs, dinosaurs laid hard-shelled eggs. But there's a few problems with that. Pterosaurs laid soft-shelled eggs, the eggshells that we do have all come from pretty derived dinosaurs and have different shell structures across different clades. These soft-shelled eggs imply that the ancestral dinosaur was laying soft-shelled eggs, which means that hard shells evolved multiple times, which accounts for why they would be structurally different in different clades. This also has implications for how dinosaurs would have been nesting, because a soft-shelled egg you can't brood as easily as a hard-shelled egg. Uh, you have to bury it so that it doesn't lose moisture. Uh, you have to have some other, I, I like how I'm saying you, like you yourself a dinosaur are considering building a nest. Uh, 
the eggs would have to be incubated by uh, decomposing plant material, for instance, some external heat source. Our next paper has a similar characteristic, where it, it's interesting in its own right, but where the research might take us is even more interesting. I'm talking about the description of Rahonavis. This was a Peravian? Sometimes it's an Avalian, but I'm just going to call it a Peravian, from late Cretaceous Madagascar, which was named and briefly described in 1998, but now we finally have a full description of the animal. So with this complete and corrected character set, someone else can come along and do phylogenetics to it, and maybe clear up why it has this weird mix of uninlagging and ununinlagging traits. You see, despite being from the late Cretaceous, Rahonavis is really important to our understanding of the Peravian to avian radiation in the Jurassic, which just continues to look completely complicated and full of homoplasy, but if it were simple, it wouldn't be biology. We have a couple of papers about what was going on inside dinosaurs' heads. Not their thoughts and dreams, but their endocranial anatomy. Irritator is a spinosaurid from the early Cretaceous of Brazil that you may have heard of, because it has a somewhat idiosyncratic name. Workers found that their brains were adapted for fish eating. The endosseous labyrinth had a very long semicircular canal on the front, and the flocular recess was large. Respectively, these improve their sensitivity to pitch down movements of the head, and control their neck reflexes during gaze stabilization. These are both very important considerations when you're trying to snap at fish. Also, the angle of those canals, as well as the way that the head articulates with the neck, implies that these animals were holding their heads pitched down somewhat, like 25 degrees or maybe more uh, down from vertical. Moving forward in time and forward in the skull, Scorpio venator is an ablosaurid from late Cretaceous Argentina. They had rows of little holes, foramina, in the edges of their snout bone, up, up at the front of the head. Rugops has these as well, and to a lesser degree so does Carnotaurus. These were connecting the blood supply to the surface of their heads, probably for heat exchange, but possibly also for supplying oxygen and nutrients and maybe even blood pressure to display structures. So even those ablosaurids that didn't have Carnotaurus's big bony adornments would have had soft tissue display structures up there. Two continents away, in what was then Laramidia, Tyrannosaurus kept dying at different ages. But they fossilized, and Thomas Carr used them to analyze how T. rex grew up in an appropriately enormous paper. Growth stages in non-avian dinosaurs are generally pretty arbitrary, but Carr used phylogenetic analysis to look at ontogeny. It's a pretty cool method. You see, instead of taking a bunch of individual genera and seeing what traits they share and trying to put them into a tree where synapomorphies show the stages of evolution. It takes individual animals of a genus and puts them into a tree to figure out where the synontomorphies indicate a growth stage. Now it helps that for Tyrannosaurus we have a lot of specimens and many of them died at different ages, uh, otherwise we couldn't do this, or at least not with as much rigor. Carr recovered six growth stages, ranging from small preteen juveniles all the way up to 28-year-old senescent adults. Or I should say adult, there's only one. It's Sue. Sue is an, an old dinosaur. It's interesting that the transition from a sleek little juvenile to a robust adult only took about two years, and it was right around when the animal reached sexual maturity, not when it reached full adult size. So you had these roughly adult-shaped Tyrannosaurus running around at half size, which is very funny to me. And then they would rapidly grow to adult size in their late teens to early 20s. And I don't mean to imply that they were done remodeling their skeleton when they hit age 15. Um, there is a lot of variation between the adult individuals that we have. That's kind of why we needed to do an analysis to find this out. But what if it's Nemesis, the Triceratops? Do we have anything about Triceratops? Not directly. We have a paper that has some bearing on the ancestry of Triceratops, and it's actually the paper that made me want to take June. So let's talk about Chasmosaurines. Workers named two new Chasmosaurines related to Pentaceratops. These are Navajoceratops and Terminocavus. There's also a potentially new species of Pentaceratops, but the workers couldn't 
determine whether it was sufficiently different from uh, Pentaceratops sternbergii. It might just be a, a growth stage. Uh, also, did you know that the type specimen of Pentaceratops lacks certain diagnostic characters? So, like, some things need to get resolved before we can say whether this is a new species or not. But plugging these specimens into a phylogenetic analysis confirmed a suspicion that there is a deep split among the chasmosaurines uh, in North America at that time, uh, specifically a geographic split. There was a sea level rise that divided the populations into north and south, and then even once the seas receded, they were different enough that they couldn't interbreed. So they were two completely separate lineages from then on. The southern Pentaceratops lineage uh, broadly got more Taurosaurus y, whereas the northern Chasmosaurus lineage asked themselves, hey, what if we had rakes on our heads? And then they did that. In the south, the parietal notch deepened and the bars on either side broadened into these plates, while the epiparietals rotated or lengthened. In the north, the parietal notch got shallower, the bars stayed as bars, and the epiparietals broadened or spread out. It seems that Triceratops and their close relatives are more closely related to the southern branch, but it's not totally clear how closely. This would explain why um, some Triceratops horridus and Taurosaurus specimens have a notch in their parietal. Uh, it's an atavism. It's, it's a, a throwback to what their ancestors were doing. And interestingly, no specimens of Triceratops prorsus show that notch. Now, the authors think we could be seeing uh, a pair of anagenetic lineages of chasmosaurians, that is, where uh, genera of animals evolve into one another. And if that's the case, that would mean that Navajoceratops and Terminocavus are uh, congeneric. They, they might even be Pentaceratops, but they couldn't prove this idea beyond doubt, partially because we're waiting on some characters to be corrected or, or just described in the first place. But for now, we welcome our new Chasmosaurians, as well as next month's Paleo Rewind host, who took July. This is Dylan of the Paleo Archive. Be sure to check that out tomorrow, as well as the full Paleo Rewind video that will go up on January 1st. We will update the description with a link to that once it's up. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong, and have a happy holiday. We would like to extend a special thank you to these individuals who have gone above and beyond to support this show. We could not have done it without you. Thank you. <laughs>